lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in England with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, one of the believers had the question, could you flesh out each one of the covenants as well as explain the, the various dispensations? This comes into the realm of what is popularly known. Oh, sorry, you have to say he's in England and all that stuff. I did. Oh, did you? Jakey with England? Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'll just begin again. I'll just begin? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, just roll. This occurs within the realm of what people speak of as systematic theology. Systematic theology. It is something that is largely a result of evangelical Protestantism and something that is largely a result of Gentile Christianity in, in its theological presentation. There are two systematic theologies. One is dispensationalism, and the other is covenant. Now, there are variations of both of these. I'll begin with covenant theology because that's not the main question asked. The heart, the center of John Calvin's actual teaching was not the tulip. The tulip came from Theodore Beza into something called the Remonstrance of Dort the Remonstrance of Dort and Holland, which was a Calvinistic or Reformed response to the position of Jacob Arminius, who challenged Calvinism in that it would make God the author of evil. Nonetheless, the tulip was not the heart of Calvinism. One of the problems you have today are most people, probably most people, particularly Baptists, who would identify themselves as Reformed or as Calvinistic are not Calvinistic in the sense that Calvin taught Calvinism. The basis of Calvin's Calvinism was covenant theology, not the tulip. You can read books, you can read journal articles and theological journals with Calvinistic scholars, Reformed theologians, and church historians arguing against each other back and forth, was Calvin a Calvinist? Did Calvin believe in the full tulip? Did he believe in particular redemption, that God made some people for hell, etc.? They debate these things among themselves. There is nothing more anti-reformed, anti-Calvinist than being a Baptist. So right away you have an oxymoron, emphasize the moron, where you have Reformed Baptists. Calvinism says the basis of God's covenant dealings with man are that there was a covenant with Adam and a covenant with Abraham. Anything else, including the new and old covenants, are derivative or are subsequent. It's mainly the covenant with Adam and God made another covenant with Abraham. These are the two covenants. Now that creates a basis for replacement theology, a basis for infant baptism, where sprinkling an infant becomes the equivalent of circumcision on the eighth day and so forth. This was Calvin's Calvinism. God made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham, and the new covenant has to be interpreted within that framework. So you have a systematic theology then where Calvinism or Reformed theology overstates the continuity between the Old and New Testament. It overstates the continuity. It makes the church effectively the replacement for Israel, or it makes the church Israel practically and effectively. This was Calvin's Calvinism. Now, Baptists, by definition, hold to believers' baptism. They don't believe that baptism is the equivalent of circumcision. There's something fundamentally illogical in being a Baptist 
and being a Calvinist. There is nothing more contradictory to Calvin's actual teaching on covenant theology, which was the heart of his actual theology, than sprinkling infants uh, or believer's baptism. If you say you hold to believer's baptism and that you don't believe in Erastianism, a state church, as most Baptists do, they're not Calvinists in the sense that Calvin was. It's almost a ridiculous form of religious babbling that you see propagated by people like James White, Reformed Baptist. There's nothing more illogical. As we've said before, Calvin would have arrested Baptists. He might have burned them. He burned many uh, in Geneva. These people are not logical or rational in what they're saying. They engage in a form of historical revisionism where they make the tulip the heart of Calvin's teaching, which it wasn't. The heart of his teaching was covenant theology, this idea that God only made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham. Second thing they do is they ignore the debacle of Geneva and what Calvin did to Baptists, not just heretical ones like Severitus, but he was against all Baptists, then called Anabaptists. He was against all of them. All of the reformers were. Luther was, Zwingli killed them. Uh, it's irrational. Reformed Baptists, Baptists who say that Calvinists are irrational people and what they're saying, it's not rational what they're saying. They have to engage in historical revisionism to come up with their fanciful definition of, of, of who they are, what they are, what they believe. If you look at what Calvin taught, you cannot be a Baptist and a Calvinist. A Baptist holds to believer's baptism. A Calvinist holds to a continuity between the old and new covenant because they're both subsequent from the Abrahamic covenant. Baptism equals circumcision. It's not rational. You have people like John MacArthur. They get the penknife out and they try to carve <laughs> the round peg to make it fit into a square hole. This is John MacArthur. He tries to say that he follows Augustine, that Augustine upheld the apostles' tradition. No, it was Augustine who marked the turning away, the departure from the apostles' position. While Augustine was right about the heresies of Pelagius, who denied original sin, Augustine, as we said many times, was a Platonist. Augustine did many things, including invent the doctrine of the visible and invisible church. In the parable of the wheat and tares, the parable itself states that. The field is the world, not the church. Augustine changes one word and one verse and makes the field the church. Therefore, you've got wheat and tares in the church, believers and non-believers in the church. Baptize everybody when they're a baby. Let God decide. No, no. no, the field was the world. This idea of an institutional church that was politically aligned with the empire was a theology rewritten to accommodate the political actions, first of Constantine and then the Emperor Justinian. And it was largely Augustine who did it under the influence of his mentors and influencers, such as Cyprian of Carthage, of Carthage and of Ambrose of Milan. He was also influenced by the Eastern Gnostic Oregon in spiritualizations of texts out of context. Uh, Augustine said, because God used violence to convert St. Paul when he knocked him off the horse, the church can use violence to convert people. He platonized the church. He turned a theology into a Greek philosophy. He spiritualized away the millennium because the millennium was now realized in the Roman Empire being Christianized. When Christendom replaced Christianity, this was Augustine. Few people have done as much harm to the body of Christ or to Christian theology as Augustine. He's the father of both Roman Catholicism and mainstream Protestantism. Now, John MacArthur can pay tribute to him and hold on to him, but John MacArthur cannot deny a single thing I've said about Augustine, not a single thing. John MacArthur is an irrational man. 
That's why he arrives at irrational rash, beliefs, like you can worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast and still be saved. John MacArthur is an irrational man. You cannot be a Baptist and be a Calvinist in the sense that Calvin taught Calvinism. A Baptist holds to believers' baptism upon regeneration. It does not see an equivalency between circumcision and baptism. A Baptist does not believe that the institution of the church should be controlled by the state or that the state should be an institution controlled by the church. They hold to a separation. Baptists don't believe the things that Calvin believed in. Yet, you've got these people who call themselves Reformed Baptists. They're not even logical. They're not even rational. Some of them become especially irrational, such as James White. That's covenant theology. That's the first systematic theology. God made two covenants, one with Abraham and one with Adam. Some of them also say that God made a covenant in eternity with Jesus, but they have no biblical evidence for any of this. When you ask them, where does the scripture say this? They say it is implied. Covenant theology has elements of truth, but it is fundamentally wrong. Its opposite is dispensationalism. Dispensationalism has a fundamental truth, but many, many errors that saturate it. Dispensationalism is the opposite of Calvinism. It says the following. It says, the first covenant God made was one of innocence with Adam before Adam fell. The second covenant was after man fell. God dealt with people as individuals. Only Enoch was saved, and during that particular time, it was the dispensation of, of, of conscience. Okay. Then with the flood, God ordained civil and juridical law. It was the covenant of human government after the flood. Then they say the next was the covenant of promise with the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then the Torah is given. It becomes the covenant of the law. Then the new covenant is given. It becomes the covenant of grace. They usually count seven. But they can't agree among themselves because God also made a covenant with David. That doesn't usually fit into their sequence. Now you've got eight. And will there be a different covenant in the millennium? Nine. In scripture, scriptural dispensationalism, the word is translated economy. Economy would be a good translation of the word in, in the Greek that, that we call dispensation. There are two, the old and the new, the one with Moses and the one with Jesus. There are two. These people trying to make seven and eight. Now, again, there are elements of truth in what they say. But they take it way beyond the realms and bounds and parameters of Scripture. Particularly dangerous are the hyper-dispensationalists, the people who follow John Nelson Darby. These people who follow Darby are the people who generally adhere to the wrong teachings of Cyrus Schofield, and a number of them went into the out and out heretical teachings of people who are opposed by Harry Ironside and moderate dispensationalists. The uh, extreme dispensational or ultra dispensational or hyper dispensational doctrines of Schofield, who was the American protege of John Nelson Darby, were opposed by Harry Ironside. But a, a, a major faction of them went into full-blown heresy following E.W. Bullinger, Bullingerism. Darby himself was opposed by moderate dispensationalists in England 
such as the brilliant Greek scholar, Dr. Samuel Tregalis, and more moderate people in the early Brethren movement. Not all dispensationalists went as far as Darby's errors or the errors of, of, of Schofield. Now remember, John Nelson Darby was a cult founder and a cult leader. The exclusive Brethren, the closed Brethren, are a hyper-dispensational cult built on party spirit with a lot of moral and financial corruption in their history. Darby founded this cult uh, and it broke away from the mainstream brethren. We have to understand that there were good brethren people like Hudson Taylor and, and, and people like um, George Mueller who opposed Darby, as did Tregalis, as did Benjamin Newton. They were not all as crazy as Darby. Um, although Darby was an intelligent man, he was off the rails fundamentally off the rails in many respects. He's also the primary founder of pre-tribulationism, but he was a cult leader and a cult founder. This cult exists to this day. And like any other cult, it teaches false doctrine, it is corrupt, it has exploitation, sexploitation, party spirit, destroys families and marriages, it still exists and Darby is the founder. Uh, Darby also took hyper dispensationalism to the point where he would say the Sermon on the Mount is for Israel, it's not for the church, or the epistle of James is part of the Old Testament. He did the same thing with the Olivet Discourse. People who are pre-trib, they have to understand they're following Darby's hyper dispensational teaching, taking major parts of the New Testament and saying it's not for the church, it's for Israel. This is how far Darby went. Others went further than him. His American protege, uh, again, Cyrus Schofield, had no theological background. He was a crooked lawyer who was a criminally convicted swindler. He was an embezzler, sent to federal prison for embezzlement. He was a professional swindler. This was Cyrus Schofield. Uh, and then the next was, of course, Bullinger, who was opposed by Harry Ironside in the United States. This is dispensationalism and hyper-dispensationalism. The problem with dispensationalism is it's based on a fundamental truth. There are dispensations, but there are two primary dispensations. The old, that is the Mosaic Covenant, the law, Deuteronomic law, Levitical sacrificial system, and the new the gospel which fulfills the old. There are other covenants, but they equate covenants with dispensations. Covenants are not dispensations, but dispensationalists make it that. Now you've got some very confused people who try to make sense of this. There are tons of Baptists in America and Britain and elsewhere, tons of them, who say, they believe in dispensationalism. At the same time, they say they're Calvinists. They hold to once saved, always saved, and things like that, the tulip and so forth. Not realizing that these two things were theologically opposed to each other. So it becomes a bit of this and a bit of that. Uh, only their definition again of Calvinism is not Calvin's. It's tulip for them. Then the covenant theology people are the real Calvinists. R.C. Sproul would have been something closer to that. Then you have, on the opposite, the dispensationalists. But you've got people mixing these together, trying to hold them together. It becomes a very convoluted bag of confusion that the early church would not have known or recognized. Dispensationalism overstates the discontinuity between the old covenant and the new. Calvinism, real Calvinism, that is covenant theology, overstates the continuity between the old and the new, that is the church in Israel. One overstates, one understates. The dispensationalist error is that they equate covenants with dispensations. They are not. 
the hyper dispensationalists go into full blown heresy, full blown wrong teaching, beginning with John Darby and Cyrus Schofield, and then ultimately to Bullinger. The covenant theology people have no biblical basis, none for what they're saying. Where does the scripture say God only ever made two covenants? One with Adam, one with they, and one with Abraham, they can't show you. It's based on asegesis. They must read things into the scripture it doesn't say. I think it is worthwhile for Christians to know these things and understand these things. But it is not necessary for Christians to believe in these things. We simply must go back to the simple faith of the early church and understand the scriptures the way the apostles taught it in the first century before the church fathers began rewriting Christianity, turning a faith into a philosophy. That is what the church fathers, particularly Augustine did. They turned, turned the faith into a philosophy. Calvinism is simply 16th century humanism masquerading as theology. All it is is 16th century humanism masquerading as first century theology. It is not. We don't need these things. We, or at least pastors and people in leadership, should be aware that churches believe these things and seminaries teach it. They should be aware of these things and know what they are. But we should not bind our congregations to them. They're the inventions of men. Calvinism, covenant theology, must engage in asegesis. It must read things into the scripture. The scripture does not say. It is the same as Roman Catholicism. To exist, it must invent things. It must exceed what is written. In contradiction to 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Calvinism, like Roman Catholicism, must exceed what is written in order to exist. To exist, it must do something that Jesus condemned. Dispensationalists, although they have a basis of truth, they take that truth too far and turn it into an error. A covenant does not equal a dispensation. It does not. You can point out that there are different covenants, but those are not economies of grace per se in and of themselves. The scriptures only teach two, the old and the new. This is the message of the book of Hebrews in large part, contrasting the two, how one fulfills the other. So I hope I helped you make sense of this confusing mess that people invented, and I didn't just make this mess more confusing for you. I took the question and I answered it to the best of my limited ability, but what I said is the truth, that it's the right explanation. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.